If you have your Bibles, open to Leviticus 23. Just going to quickly reread the passage on the Day of Atonement. And then we're going to flip over to the book of Hebrews, where we'll spend most of the day, most of the message. <clears throat> Father, we lift up the reading of your word. I ask, Father, that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart will be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. I ask, Father, that you would instruct us through the reading of your word. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Verse 26, And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Now on the tenth day of this seventh month is the day of atonement. It shall be for you a time of holy convocation, and you shall afflict yourselves and present a food offering to the Lord. And you shall not do any work on that very day, for it is a day of atonement, to make atonement for you before the Lord your God. For whoever is not afflicted on that very day shall be cut off from his people. And whoever does any work on that very day, that person I will destroy from among the people. You shall not do any work. It is a statute forever throughout your generations and all your dwelling places. It shall be to you a Sabbath of solemn rest, and you shall afflict yourselves. On the ninth day of the month, beginning at evening, from evening to evening, you shall keep your Sabbath. Now, we've undertaken this study of the feasts with the understanding that when God gave these, he was doing a prophetic illustration of his plan of redemption. And as we work through the spring feast, we saw with the first um, coming of Jesus, how he fulfilled the first four feasts, the spring feasts. We saw how the feast of Passover, he was our Paschal lamb. We saw during the feast of unleavened bread that he was perfect and spotless. We saw... Um, at the Feast of First Fruits, uh, Paul writes that he was the firstborn of the dead, and if he is the firstborn, there will be others that follow, which would be us. Um, and then we saw at uh, the Feast of Pentecost that the church was born. Now, in order to kind of understand the progression of these things, um, does anybody here know what a chiasm is? I've mentioned it a couple times. I know Kelly talked about it quite a bit. A chiasm is a, a writing, a tool in writing, whereby you present uh, a couple of ideas, and you'll go A, and then B, and then C, and then reverse, and go C, B, and A. So it's a, a tool that is used to reinforce an idea. If you read through the Psalms, if you read through the prophets, you'll see chiasms are used significantly. Okay, and it's called a chiasm because the Greek letter X, this is the one side of the X, A, B, C, C, B, A. I believe that when God gave these prophetic feasts, he was creating a chiasm. And, and you'll get to see a little bit later how that all unfolds. Now, we've talked about the Feast of Trumpets. Um, Today we're, we're working, um, my plan is to finish the Feast of Atonement, and then we'll wrap up this part uh, with the Feast of Tabernacles, okay? But I want you guys to start looking, go back and examine these feasts, and see if you can start seeing how the feasts are kind of laid out in a chiasm, all right? So, we've moved to the Fall Feasts. The first uh, feast in the Fall um, was the Feast of Trumpets. We believe, looking forward, that when the Messiah returns with his second advent, it, it, Scripture says it's going to be announced with the blowing of a trumpet. Okay? Um, a trumpet blast that will be heard around the world. Now, if you ever have the opportunity, go out to YouTube and see if you can find a video of Jerusalem on the day of the celebration of the Feast of Trumpets. Because hundreds of these things are going off all at the same time. It's incredible to hear. Um, and yet, we don't hear it here. You can only hear it in Jerusalem and, and 
just shortly outside of Jerusalem. As a matter of fact, you get over to the other side of the mountains and you can't hear it. Okay, But there will be a trumpet blast that will announce the Messiah, and I believe that, that, that the church will be raptured and taken away. Okay, um, The Feast of Atonement, now, you know, I, I, I kind of struggled with the Feast of Atonement because isn't that what Jesus did when he went to the cross? He, he made atonement for us. I think I'm understanding better why the Feast of Atonement is, is in the fall in the second coming. And we're going to talk about that as we get through. Now, I'm going to be hitting some scriptures in Hebrews very quickly. Okay, I've got them. They'll be up on the overhead so you can write them down. I would encourage you to, <coughs> excuse me, go back and study them deeper. But you have to understand the Feast of Atonement from Leviticus 16, Leviticus 23, in order to understand what is going on in the book of Hebrews. Okay? If you can grasp, if you can have a fundamental understanding of what's going on at the Feast of Atonement, it will bring to life so many passages out of Hebrews because the writer is Hebrew and he is writing to Hebrews. So he is putting pictures in there of something that they know in order to get them to understand what's happening. And he's using the Feast of Atonement from chapter 4 all the way almost to the end. He keeps cycling back to it, cycling back to the familiar so that they can get a, an understanding of what's going on. All right, so I'm just going to hit these really quickly. Uh, we've talked already um, about the passages in chapter 4 and chapter 5. Today we're going to pick up in Hebrews chapter 7. If you would please turn there. So we have determined, first in Hebrews chapter 4, that Jesus was in a better position than the Aaronic priests. We saw that he was a better priest because he was coming as the order of Melchizedek, not the order of Aaron. Uh, we also, it's something important, I'm going to reiterate this again, I'm going to keep pounding this into your head. When the Hebrew Scriptures write forever, we look at forever as eternity. It will never end. That's not what the Jewish thinking is. When they use that word, they're thinking for a set amount of time. This will hold true for a set amount of time. Okay, well, we're going to see a little bit of that understanding in, this, in these coming passages. Okay, so we see that... Um, because he's of the order of Melchizedek, um, he is a, a different and, and superior order than the order of Aaron. Now in seven, chapter 7, uh, I'm going to read verses 11 through 25, and then we're going to go back and draw some things out of them. Verse 11. Now if perfection had been attainable through the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need would there have been for another priest to arise after the order of Melchizedek, rather than one named after the order of Aaron. Okay, do you see the correlation he's drawing here? This is a continuation of things we've already looked at. He's saying the, there was a prophetic utterance given by David that God would raise up one, a, a high priest of the order of Melchizedek. Now David, this is 400 plus years after the giving of the law and the establishing of the Levitic priesthood. The Aaronic priesthood. Okay, so David is prophesying that there is another priesthood to come that will not be of the order of Aaron, not be of the order of the Levites, but would be of the order of Melchizedek. Okay, so his, his argument is, you know, if, if, if there could be perfection through the law, then why do we need a replacement? Why do we need to change things? So verse 12, for when there is a change in the priesthood, there is necessarily a change in the law as well. For the one of whom these things are spoken belong to another tribe from which no one has ever served at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord was descended from Judah and in connection with the tribe of Moses said nothing about priests. So if we have to change the priesthood, we have to change the law because the priesthood is established in the law. All right. This is his argument. 
Now flip over, we'll continue reading. This becomes even more evident when another priest arises in the likeness of Melchizedek, who has become a priest not on the basis of a legal requirement concerning bodily descent, but by the power of an indestructible life. For it is witnessed of him, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. For on the one hand, a former commandment is set aside because of its weakness and uselessness, for the law made nothing perfect. But on the other hand, a better hope is introduced, through which we draw near to God. Did, did you? That's huge. This is, this is huge, what he's saying here. Because part of what made the Jews the Jews in their thinking was the law. That made them unique. Okay? They, they didn't fully grasp that God gave them the law to illustrate for them that you, by your own actions, can never make yourselves holy. You will always fail. Every year, the Day of Atonement, guess what? You're going to need atonement. Okay? So, he's, he's establishing, he's, he's putting this thing forward that completely takes away the privilege that the Jews think they have because of the law. And he says, hey, if the law could make you perfect, why is there a need for another one? And, and if the priesthood was sufficient, why do we need another one? Verse 20, And it was not without an oath, for those who formerly became priests were made such without an oath. But this one was made a priest with an oath by the one who said to him, The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind, you are a priest forever. This makes Jesus the guarantor of a better covenant. The former priests were many in number because they were prevented by death from continuing in office. But he holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him since he always lives to make intercession for him. Okay, now that, there's a lot packed in there. We're just going to break out a few thoughts from here. But I want you to, to take time. I want you to start working through the, the book of Hebrews. And I want you to lay it side by side with everything that was required by the law of Moses in Leviticus 16 and Leviticus 23 for the Feast of Atonement. Okay? Uh, by the way, feast is, is, a, is actually a very poor use of the word. The word actually means an appointed time. Because when we think of feast, what do we think of? food okay and yet this feast they were required to fast there was no food okay so um, when, when we say feast really it's better said the appointed time or the appointed day not not feast like we understand and interpret it in in our culture okay so let's take a look at this we'll break some things out here really quickly and then we're going to touch very lightly on some things because I really want to get to how this is going to come about. Um, first, he goes through the Levitic priesthood and says it's transitory. It's not perfect. Second, it was temporary and was going to be replaced by the perfect Melchizedek order. Uh, next point, um, the new priesthood is immutable. It will never leave the person of Jesus Christ. Okay. Under the Levitic priesthood, under the Aaronic priesthood, priests died. And so a new priest had to be appointed. And, and, and you had to keep it going. And yet when God prophesied and spoke through David, he said, You will be an order of the order of you will be a priest forever of the order of Melchizedek. He says forever. Okay? Now again, that's for a set time. But what is the set time in this? We know from the other writings, the set time for this is eternity. Because Jesus will always be Lord. He will always be priest. He will make intercession for us because that's his, his job as a priest. Um, so going forward, um, let's uh, quickly touch on verses 26 through 28. It was indeed fitting that we should have had a high priest, holy, innocent, unstained, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. He has no need, like those high priests, to offer sacrifices daily, first for his own sin, and then for those of the people. 
since he did this once for all when he offered himself up. For the law appoints men in their weakness as high priests, but the word of the oath which came later than the law appoints a son who has been made perfect forever. Now again, go back and lay that side by side with Leviticus 16. Remember that the priest had to bring a bull and sacrifice it. He had to take the blood into the most holy place and sprinkle it for his and his family's sins. He had to do that first, that when he offered the sacrifice for the people, he would already have his sins covered. If his sins were not covered, and he came in to present the offering for the sins of all the people, guess what happened to the priest? It wasn't good. Most likely, he would have been struck down. Okay? So, we're looking at this, and, and he says, you know, he has no need like those high priests to offer sacrifices daily, first for his own sins, and then for those of the people. Well, Jesus wasn't offering the sacrifice to cover sin. He was offering himself as the sacrifice to remove sin, to take it away. Verse 28, for the law appoints men in their weakness as high priests. But God, in his oath, in the promise that he gave, which was after the law, okay, you got to pay attention to timing in these things, okay, because um, Paul writes that we are saved by faith and we are children of Abraham because Abraham was considered righteous because of his faith. His faith was exhibited 400 years prior to the giving of the law, okay? That's the basis for Paul's whole argument that, that salvation comes by grace through faith and not of works. Because if you could attain it through the law, there would be no need for grace. Okay? So in this same context, the, the law was established, and then afterward God says, hey, look, there's going to be something better coming. It's, the, it's going to be a lot easier. It's going to be better. Okay? So let's, let's go forward again. I'm, I know I'm going fast. I'm, I'm skipping quite a bit. Uh, Hebrews 8, <clears throat> 1 through 13. <clears throat> now the point in what we are saying is this. We have such a high priest. One who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven. A minister in the holy places. In the true tent that the Lord set up, not man. For every high priest is appointed to offer gifts and sacrifices. Thus it is necessary for the priest also to have something to offer. Now, if he were on earth, he would not be a priest at all, since there are priests who offer gifts according to the law. They serve a copy and a shadow of heavenly things. For when Moses was about to erect the tent, he was instructed by God, saying, See that you make everything according to the pattern that was shown you on the mountain. But as it is, Christ has obtained a ministry that is much more excellent than the old, as the covenant he mediates is better, since it is enacted on better promises. You know, I could spend probably three Sundays just going over those few verses and unpacking that. Um, we'll save that for another time. For if that first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no occasion to look for a second. Okay, a couple things I want to draw out real quickly. Everything that the Jews had here on earth first with their tabernacle and then later with their temple, was a shadow, a copy, an imitation of the true thing that exists in heaven. Okay? And so when they're doing things, they're, they're imitating what is taking place in heaven. And when the high priest does these things, he is imitating what Christ has done at Calvary and continues to do in heaven. All right? God laid this all out so that they would have an understanding of what was necessary for redemption. But it couldn't completely redeem them because we are saved by faith, not works, not by fulfilling the law. Somebody could, could live every point of the law and yet they still carry within them sin. Okay? Because... Jesus said it's not our actions that are sin, it's what's in our heart, it's what's in our thinking, it's our soul. That's where sin exists. 
Now, you may act out on your sin, and then everybody else goes, ah, sin! Okay? But God sees the heart, and he sees what, how that thing was given birth. Okay? So, it's better <clears throat> because it's the, the real thing, the original. It's not a copy. Um, and Jesus is better than the priests and the high priest here on earth because he's at the original. And he's making intercession where God intended it to be made. Right before him. Right before himself. Okay? So going down a little bit further, verse 8. But he finds fault with them when he says, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will establish a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not like the covenants that I made with their fathers. On the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, for they did not continue in my covenant. And so I showed no concern for them, declares the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law into their minds and write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And they shall not teach each one his neighbor, each one his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest. For I will be merciful toward their iniquities, and I will remember their sins no more. In speaking of a new covenant, he makes the first one obsolete. And what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. <clears throat> See, the writer of Hebrews is, is letting everybody know this was God's intent all along. Okay? The, the, the law... The offerings, the sacrifices, those were, those were never intended to be an end unto themselves. They were a shadow of what was coming. It was so that when the true arrived, they would be able to go, ah, I see, I get it. Okay? Now, the Jews didn't get it, did they? As a people, as a whole, they didn't get it. And so God, uh, Romans 9, 10, and 11 tells us that, that he... He broke off their branch and he set it to the side. And there's a time that the Gentiles are being drawn in. And, and the purpose for this drawing in is that it would make the Jews jealous and envious. That, that they would want what we have. The relationship, the intimacy of a God that meets with us personally, not behind the veil. The Holy Spirit that comes and dwells with us continually, not for a moment, not for a purpose, and then leaves. Okay? So, so God has given us this time that we might make the Jews jealous. All right? So, <clears throat> you're seeing the correlation. <clears throat> Hopefully, you're seeing the correlation about Jesus' ministry and his position being better than what the Jews had. <clears throat> um, I'm just going to hit these real quick. I'm just going to go by keynotes because I really want to get to the core of this. I want to get to the heart of this. Hebrews chapter 9, verses 1 through 10. We have a better sanctuary. The writer compares the old sanctuary with the new sanctuary and concludes that ours is better because everyone has access. It's not just the high priest in just one day a year. Everyone has access to this new sanctuary. Uh, verses 11 through uh, the end of chapter 10 talk about a better sacrifice. All right? Uh, the first part of 9, there are three areas that the author emphasizes the Messiah's sacrifice. And it's better because it was human. So first, he says, this sacrifice works in heaven. Second, it's better because it's the blood of a person, a man, not an animal. And third... His sacrifice is eternal. It, 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 it didn't need to be repeated. Once it was done, it was done for all time. Okay? Then going down a little bit further, uh, we find three results of the Messiah's sacrifice. One, sin is not just covered, it's removed completely. It's gone. Taken away from us. Uh, the new covenant is sealed, is ratified by the Messiah's blood. Now remember, the Old Covenant was done with the blood of the animals. 
This covenant is sealed with the blood of Jesus Christ. Three, the Messiah ministers in the heavenly tabernacle, which is better than the earthly one because Jesus is in the very presence of the Almighty God. And he's interceding on our behalf. You know, that, that right there should give you such an incredible feeling of excitement. That Jesus didn't just go, okay, you know, hey, I came, they put me on the cross, I shed my blood, I died, they put me in the tomb, I said, enough of the tomb, and out I come. I'm done. My job is done. No. It, it, that's actually really the beginning of his job. Because now that the blood has been shed, now that he has been raised from the dead, now he lives to make intercession for us. Now he is the one that pleads our argument when the enemy comes and accuses us and, and probably says very truthful things about us. Jesus says, no, 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 no. Uh, I paid that price. He's our defender. He's, he's our intercessor. He's the one that stands up and represents us. Okay? So going down, <clears throat> chapter 10, 1 through 18, um, we, want, we see... Um, how efficient, what we see the outcome of the Messiah's sacrifice, um, 1 through 4, chapter 10, 1 through 4, mm -hmm. it just talks about the, the old sacrifice was insufficient. It, it, it couldn't do, it couldn't take away the sin, all it could do was cover over it. Verses 5 through 10, um, Jesus' sacrifice is sufficient because of his obedience. Okay? It wasn't just any person's blood. It had to be perfect. It had to be pure. It had to be spotless. And by living his life in complete obedience to the Father, his blood was sufficient. 11 through 14, um, we see that the old sacrifices, because it was not sufficient, had to be repeated over and over. But the Messiah's sacrifice was once for all time. Verses 15 through 18, we go back to Jeremiah's prophecy and, and the author reiterates at the establishment of a new covenant in perpetuity. Okay, that's when the, this passage that I just read that we quoted out of Hebrews, I will, I will take away their sins and I will put my law in their heart and in their mind and, and you're not going to need people to come and tell you and, and teach you because I'm going to be living in you and, and you won't need that anymore. That's, that's the fulfillment that Jesus is bringing for us. Okay. Now I'm going to jump ahead real quick to Hebrews chapter 13. Turn there with me if you would. Again, I'm going to hit this pretty quick because I really want to get to the good stuff. Not that this is not good, but you know the, the, the way we wrap this up is the cherry on the top. So Hebrews chapter 13, I'm going to pick up in verse 10. We're going to read down through 16. We have an altar from which those who serve the tent have no right to eat. For the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the holy place by the high priest as a sacrifice for sin are burned outside the camp. Okay, do you, do you see the correlation to the Feast of Atonement there? Because when the sacrifice was made, when the blood was shed and the offering was burned, what was left over had to be taken outside the camp and burned. Okay, it could not be used for anything else. It had to be destroyed because the whole purpose of that offering was, was to uh, cover sin. Okay, so he's, he's laying out things that the Jews go, okay, yeah, I see what you're talking about here. Um, verse 12, so Jesus also suffered outside the gate in order to sanctify the people through his own blood. Okay, this is a reference to where Jesus died. Okay, he died outside the city, outside the camp. Therefore, let us go to him outside the camp and bear the reproach he endured. For here we have no lasting city, but we seek the city that is to come. Through him, then, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God, that is, the fruit of lips that acknowledge his name. Do not neglect to do good, and to share what you have, for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. Now, the whole just of this, this passage right here is that the altar that, that was laid out for us is better than the altar that the Jews had. The brazen altar, the altar of incense, ours is better because it was all wrapped up into one. 
It was, and it took care of everything. They didn't need to keep coming back and repeating it and repeating it and repeating it. And, and uh, oh, I goofed, so I got to go and offer again. And uh, I goofed again. You know, on my way to go and fix my goof, I goofed again. And uh, how many lambs am I up to now? Yeah. Okay? Jesus' blood covered sin once and for all. Okay? <coughs> so there's a couple of takeaways that I want you to have um, from Hebrews. One. Jesus is the promised Messiah from the Hebrew Scriptures. Two, he serves as high priest in heaven, not on earth. Three, he is a priest of the order of Melchizedek in fulfillment of prophecy. Four, the covenant that he serves is an eternal covenant shall never be broken, never be replaced. Five, his blood sacrifice was for the heavenly sanctuary, not the earthly one. Okay? Because they didn't take his blood and go sprinkle it. That was for the heavenly sanctuary. Number six, his blood is superior to the blood of animals and sufficient. That there's no need for any other sacrifice. Okay? So we've gone through, we spent several weeks on this. I think we're up to six, seven weeks. Because I want you to get an understanding. You know, <clears throat> you can build walls without a foundation and they'll stay for a while. But they're not nearly as secure as walls that are built on a foundation. And a lot of times as Western Christians... We want to go straight to the walls and, and not really attempt to understand the foundation on which those walls are built. See, salvation didn't just come, you know, at the end of the book of Matthew. God's plan from the beginning was the redemption of man. And he establishes that right at the first sin. He, he, he makes a promise at the first sin when he's speaking to, to Eve. And the snake, and, and he says, you know, your seed, being singular, not plural, will bruise the serpent's head, and the serpent will bruise his heel. That's the first promise of the Messiah that would come and redeem man, restore us to a right relationship with God. And now God spends, you know, from Genesis 3 all the way to the end of Malachi, not just wasting idle time and, and fancy stories and really boring prophecies, um, he spends this time setting up the plan whereby we could be redeemed. If we just read, now, I'm not to denigrate the New Testament. It's important. It is the Word of God. It is inspired by His Spirit. It carries His truth. But if the New Testament is all you spend your time in, you're only getting a little part of the picture. All right? So, with the, the Day of Atonement, we have the establishing of, of, of a, a process whereby we will be redeemed. Now, are we redeemed? Are you redeemed? Yes. Okay, well, uh, you guys got real quiet, so I'm wondering which one of you is not. Um, I guess I should make it personal. Are you redeemed, not are we redeemed, because you have no idea if the person sitting next to you is or not. <clears throat> if we are redeemed, if atonement has been made for us, why is this feast in the fall feast, in the, the feast that have yet to be fulfilled? Okay, remember that chiasm that I talked about? We talked about uh, the Passover lamb coming and making sacrifice for our sins. <clears throat> that was the first point. And then we went to the, day of, or the, the um, feast of unleavened bread. We went to the feast of first fruits. And then we ended up the spring feast at Pentecost. What was Pentecost? How was that fulfilled? Church. The birth of the, the church, yeah. The spirit was given to the believers and the church was birthed out of it. Okay, now if we reverse our course from this point, if you look from A to D, these things are happening specifically to the Jews right up until the feast of uh, Shavuot? Shavuot. Shavuot. Okay, the feast of weeks. 
And then there's this weird thing that happens, and, and we see it looking in the, the book of Acts. You start one, go all the way through 11 and, and 12, and you'll see that God takes this, this nucleus of believers, those followers of Jesus, and he warns them because what you know when Jesus ascended on high, what did they do? They camped out in Jerusalem. Okay, I don't. Know, we're going to meet every day. We're going to go up to the temple and we're, we'll meet and we'll teach and we'll we'll see these things and we'll we'll bring people to Christ and and. But what did Jesus tell them before he left? Go, you will be my witnesses. So go, you got to go and be my witnesses. So what happens? God says, hey, they're not moving. Flick. And, and he disperses them out of Jerusalem. And all of a sudden, we see the largest, most rapid growth of a cult up until the time of a cult, of a faith up until the time <laughs> of Islam. Okay. Now, the, the, the difference between the two is Islam is the only faith system that spread on a level consistent with or equal to Christianity. But you look at the way these two faith systems were spread. Okay. Because when Islam spread, it spread by the fire and the sword. Convert or die. Okay? When Christianity spread, it spread through the shed blood of Jesus Christ and the, and the idea of self-sacrifice. And, and the, it was not convert or die, it is you're already dead. Convert to live. Okay? So you see a radical difference because what is the enemy? He is an imitator of God. He can't do original things. All he can do is try and copy God. So Islam is his attempt to copy God. All right? So we see the birth of the church, and then we have the fall feasts. Uh, now, keep in mind, from the last spring feast, Shavuot, until the, the Feast of Trumpets, we have the summer period. That's the period we are in right now. That's the church age. That's when, when God is working through. He's gathering in the Gentiles. He is, has set the Jews to the side for a time. And, and we know from uh, Romans 11 that he will return them. He will take that broken branch and he will graft it back in. Okay, but for the time right now, it's the church age. What is the first feast in the fall? It's the Feast of Trumpets. And what happens? The church is taken out of this earth. Okay, the church is removed. See, the course is already reversing. Because God brought the church in at Pentecost, and now he's taking them out at the Feast of Trumpets. Okay, And then we come to the Day of Atonement. Well, if we're not here, if the Christians are not here, who is the Day of Atonement for? Jews. The Jews, because he has promises to them that are yet to be fulfilled. Now, you go, well, okay, that's nice, but isn't that kind of speculation? Yeah, it would be, except for Scripture. Okay, because there's two passages that I want to share with you that I think will open this thing up so you understand that the, the Day of Atonement, why it's not fulfilled in completion yet, and why it's yet to be fulfilled. So, we're going to go, um, if you have your Bible, flip open to Hosea, chapter 5. Pretty sure I have Hosea in my Bible. <laughs> there we go. Okay. Now, I'm going to read a passage out of Hosea 5, and I want you to listen with the understanding how the atonement is going to affect the people of Israel. Okay? So in verse 1, he starts off, he says, Hear this, O priests. <laughs> Pay attention, O house of Israel. Give ear, O house of the king. For the judgment is for you. For you have been a snare at Mizpah, and a net spread upon Tabor. And the revolters have gone deep into the slaughter, but I will discipline all of them. I know Ephraim and Israel is not hidden from me. For now, O Ephraim, you have played the whore. Israel is defiled. Their deeds do not permit them to return to their God, for the spirit of whoredom is within them, and they know not the Lord. 
The pride of Israel testifies to his face. Israel and Ephraim shall stumble in his guilt. Judah also shall, shall stumble with them. With their flocks and herds, they shall go to seek the Lord, but they will not find him. He is withdrawn from them. They have dealt faithlessly with the Lord, for they have borne alien children. Now the new moon shall devour them in their fields. Blow the horn in Gibeah, the trumpet in Ramah. Sound the alarm at Beth Avon. We follow you, O Benjamin. Ephraim shall become a desolation in the day of punishment among the tribes of Israel. I make known what is sure. The princes of Judah have become like those who move the landmark. Upon them I will pour out my wrath like water. Ephraim is oppressed, crushed in judgment because he is determined to go after filth. But I am like a moth to Ephraim and like dry rot to the house of Judah. When Ephraim saw his sickness and Judah his wounds, then Ephraim went to Assyria and sent to the great king, but he is not able to cure you or heal your wounds. For I will be like a lion to Ephraim and like a young lion to the house of Judah. I, even I, will tear and go away. I will carry off and no one shall rescue. I will return again to my place until they acknowledge their guilt and seek my face and in their distress earnestly seek me. Okay. We see the, the tribulation that is going to be on Israel. Okay. And except for one verse, we could look at that and say, well, that was fulfilled with the Assyrians and the Babylonians and the Greeks and the Romans and the Nazis and except for this last verse. Okay. I will return again to my place until they acknowledge their guilt and seek my face and in their distress earnestly seek me. Who's returning to their place? Well, the person speaking is God. Okay? But what part of God came to earth? Jesus. 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 Now put this in light of the day of his death when the Jews who knew the law, they knew the prophecies they knew the writings rejected him as the Messiah okay you say well you know yeah he returned to his place, they killed him oh, well they killed him but three days later he rose again and he walked around and around and people saw him and he taught and then he returned to his place when he ascended on the Mount of Olives. And he's going to stay there until they acknowledge their guilt and seek his face. And in their distress, earnestly seek me. Now, over all of these weeks, there's one word in each of the passages in, in uh, Leviticus 16 and Leviticus 23 concerning the Day of Atonement that you guys, I, I pointed out to you. Does anybody remember the word that I said to keep in your mind, because this word is significant. Affliction. 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 See, in both Leviticus 16 and Leviticus 23, they, they are instructed they have to afflict themselves. But the Jews didn't understand what that meant, so they made it a day of fasting. And they said, you can't eat from this time to this time. Now, there were some groups among the Jews that did certain things, some of them that would, would uh, abuse themselves, and some that would do other things. Um, but, but we don't have a clear definition as to what affliction they were supposed to do, okay? This is their affliction, okay? When you put this in the light of the Day of Atonement, okay, the affliction that is going to come on them is going to be the tribulation. God is going to put them into a place where it will be impossible for them to say, hey, look look at all the deeds that we've done by our own strength, by our own wisdom, by our own insight. And they're going to be in that place when the nations of the world come against them and the armies of the world come against them and they are reduced to living in a very small area in Israel and all the nations are gathered against them and they have no other choice but to call out to God to repent of their sin, to repent of their, their, their willful ignorance, and, and to accept and acknowledge the Messiah. Okay? Now, this is the affliction 
that is going to come on that will bring resolution to the Day of Atonement. Now, one other passage. Turn to Zechariah, if you would, please. <coughs> Zechariah chapter 12. <clears throat> hmm. Keep your finger on Hosea because we've got to go back to it. Actually, let's just do that now. You just thought you were safe. Because I, I need to pick up these verses in chapter 6. Because remember that when the Bible was written, when the prophecy was given, it wasn't given by chapter and verse. Okay. Um, chapter 6. We just said that they, uh, in their distress, they will earnestly seek him. Uh, 6 verse 1. Come, let us return to the Lord, for he has torn us, that he may heal us. He has struck us down, and he will bind us up. After two days, he will revive us. On the third day, he will raise us up, that we may live before him. Let us know, let us press on to know the Lord. His going out as sure as the dawn, he will come to us in the showers as the spring rains that water the earth. You guys see the picture here? Does, does this make it a little clearer? Because this is tagged right on. When they seek him, he didn't, he's not doing this just to destroy them. Okay? God's intent is never just to destroy. There's something beyond. Okay? His, his intent is not to ruin them as a people. His intent is that by injuring him, injuring them, they will call out to him and he will then be able to restore them. He will bind up their wounds. Okay? So, after two days, he will revive us. On the third day, he will raise us up. Does that not speak to the resurrection? Okay. Uh, that we may live before him. Because up to this point, they are dead. Scripture says that they are dead in their sins. Okay, now let's go to Zechariah real quick. I'm going to wrap this up. Zechariah chapter 9. Um, chapter 9. Uh, speaks about the great judgment in the tribulation. Um, it speaks of the war of Armageddon. And it speaks of the physical affliction that Israel will suffer. But it says something else. It says that this physical affliction <coughs> excuse me, will lead to a spiritual affliction. So 9 talks about the physical affliction. And then flip over real quick to chapter 12. I'm going to wrap up on this. Um, the oracle of the word of the Lord concerning Israel, thus declares the Lord, who stretched out the heavens and founded the earth and formed the spirit of man within him. Behold, I am about to make Jerusalem a cup of staggering to all the surrounding people. The siege of Jerusalem will also be against Judah. On that day, I will make Jerusalem a heavy stone for all the peoples. All who will lift it will surely hurt themselves, and all the nations of the earth will gather against it. On that day, declares the Lord, I will strike every horse with panic and its rider with madness. But for the sake of the house of Judah, I will keep my eyes open when I strike every horse of the peoples with blindness. Then the clans of Judah shall say to themselves, The inhabitants of Jerusalem have strength through the Lord of hosts their God. Okay, now remember what we read <clears throat> in Hosea, that at some point they will turn and they will call out. That's what's happening here. The inhabitants of Jerusalem have strength through the Lord of hosts, their God. Verse 6, on that day I will make the clan of Judah, clans of Judah like a blazing pot in the midst of the wood, like a flaming torch among the sheaves. And they shall devour to the right and to the left all the surrounding peoples, while Jerusalem shall again be inhabited in its place in Jerusalem. And the Lord shall give salvation to the tents of Judah first, that the glory of the house of David and the glory of the inhabitants of Jerusalem may not surpass that of Judah. On that day, the Lord will protect the inhabitants of Jerusalem so that the feeblest among them on the day shall be like David, and the house of David shall be like God, 
like the angel of the Lord going before them. And on that day, I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. Okay, so we see this, this picture, this horrific picture of the war that's coming. We see that the transition in that war, because up to this point, Judah is going to be compressed in on itself. Jerusalem will be encircled. And then at that point, when they call out to God and they acknowledge that he is their strength, everything flips and it's, it's a reverse of course. And <clears throat> so we see this horrific day that is coming. But in verse 10, look, there's a, a shift in transition, a transition here to the prophecy. He says, and I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and pleas for mercy so that when they look on me, on him whom they have pierced, they shall mourn for him as one mourns for an only child and weep bitterly over him as one weeps for a firstborn. On that day, the mourning of Jerusalem will be as great as the mourning for Hadad Rimon in the plains of Megiddo. The, the land shall mourn, each family by itself, the family of the house of David by itself, and their wives by themselves, the family of the house of Nathan by itself, and the, their wives by themselves, the family of the house of Levi by itself, and their wives by themselves, the family of the Shimeites by itself, and their wives by themselves, and all the families that are left, each by itself, and their wives by themselves. Now verse 13 Verse, or chapter 13, verse 1. On that day there shall be a fountain open for the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to cleanse them from sin and uncleanliness. See, the, the end result of this battle, this war, this persecution, this tribulation, is that that thing in their brain that is preventing them from accepting the Messiah will go click, and they will look on him whom they have pierced. And they will mourn because, man, there is nothing so devastating as a lie revealed and truth applied. When you absolutely believe something for the entirety of your life and then all of a sudden it's proven to be wrong, it, it can be devastating. Okay? And when they realize exactly the Messiah that had come, they rejected and they, they shunned and they put off and they crucified. And they couldn't keep him dead, so they made lies. When all of this comes to this place, they are going to mourn. They're going to grieve. Because that hardness of heart, that hardness of their thinking is going to be shattered. In an instant, it will be made dust. And when truth comes pouring in, they're going to mourn. And then, the fountains will be opened. Then, Christ will make things right. Why is the Feast of Atonement not done? Because Israel has not yet been afflicted. They have not been afflicted to the point where they will turn and call out for help. There's a day coming when that will happen. My belief is we won't be here to see it from this point. We will be with God. And we will see it from that point. Okay? Because I, I, I don't know about you guys. But I fully plan on coming down on a white horse and watch Jesus do his work. Okay? I'm hoping for a mild horse. <laughs> okay? You guys that, that ride horses a lot, you can have the crazy ones. Okay? But there's a day coming. If we follow our chiasm down, it started off to the Jew first. Passover. To the Jew first. Unleavened bread to the Jew first, the feast of first fruits, and then there's this shift at Pentecost, Shavuot, the, the, the feast of weeks, where the church is birthed, and as the church is birthed, the Holy Spirit goes out, and all of a sudden Gentiles are being brought in. And at that point, we enter into the period of the church age, and the first fulfillment will be the, uh, of the fall feast will be the feast of trumpets when it is my belief that that trumpet sounds and the church will be taken away and the Holy Spirit that is giving the church life will be removed and that will open the door for the enemy to come in and do whatever he wants with the people that are left. Okay, With the purpose of that being that the Jews, when they suffer their, their physical affliction and then their spiritual affliction, they will call out to God, they will call out to Christ and they will be saved. Okay? So, as we work down in the spring feasts, we're working back out in the fall feasts, and the end purpose of all of this, <coughs> excuse, excuse me, 
the result of all of this is that all of creation will be redeemed. All of it. It will all be put back to the state that God originally intended it to be. And you know what? It's even going to be better. Okay? Because when Adam and Eve were walking on the earth, there were no streets, much less streets of gold. Okay? So that's the end game. Always keep in mind what is the end game. Okay? So next week, um, we will start on the Feast of Tabernacles. This is such a cool end to these prophetic feasts. It's awesome. We're going to touch on that. We'll, we'll get into there. We'll dig some d deep things out of it. And then we have one more feast after that because we've already covered. These are the, the feasts in Leviticus 23, but there are two more feasts that the, the Jews celebrate. There's the Feast of Hanukkah, which we already talked about last December. And there's also the Feast of uh, Purim. And we'll talk about that as well. Those are not feasts included, but, but God did give them credibility because both of them are in his word. Okay? They're just not the part of the prophetic feasts of uh, Leviticus 23.